one. So just click on it. Hello and welcome to another episode of Music, Philosophy, and More. Um, I'm excited to have a round two boxing match, very friendly boxing match with my buddy uh, James Behan Jr. So welcome, James. Welcome back. Thanks, John Henry. It's great to be back. I uh, put enough meat and tenderizer on my wounds. Uh, I'm, I'm like uh, Rocky <laughs> getting ready for round two with Apollo Creed. Yes, it's, it's that serious. Right. <laughs> James Brown's going to start dancing soon enough. Sweet. Um, so is that uh, a picture of New Orleans behind you? It is. It is. Yeah, it's a picture of somewhere in the French Quarter. I figured I would look a little more uh, festive than an office wall. <laughs> so, yeah, that's yeah. one thing I didn't bring up last time was that uh, I kind of hinted at it, but uh, I, I, while I, we talked a lot about memory lane, uh, I live here in New Orleans now. Uh, my wife mm -hmm. and uh, her family were from here. I met her up in New York uh, oh, okay. and, and it turned into a really good thing. One of the thoughts was, could we live here? Could, could I pick up and, and move down here? And, and um, yep, I, I, I've lived here for almost eight years now and it's been, it's been really good, really, really good. One or two hurricane evacuations. That's not terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> not, not terribly fun, but it's part of the part and parcel of the New Orleans experience. Wow, yeah. So that, that generates a few questions there for me. But um, so do you, you guys have some sort of hurricane prep kit or some box, a few boxes you grabbed for that type yeah, of thing? Yeah, that's well, last year taught us to do that. So yeah, we're we're working on putting that together. We're we're uh, we're in a good spot right now, but this August and September are when things get uh, interesting around here. Mm -hmm. um, and people all of a sudden turn into meteorologists and they they learn I learn more about hurricanes and how storm systems work once uh once this time of year rolls around yeah I, I wonder what the uh like the long-term history of hurricanes in the area is have the people have people researched that like could you easily find out about it you could yeah I'm sure you could there's uh, uh, just as importantly you tell by however the older the person that you speak with here in New Orleans, uh, the more big storms they'll name. Uh, for us, like last year, it was Ida. And then before that, it was Hurricane Katrina in 2005. And then there's Betsy, they often talk about, which is like 65 or so. Um, and it's it's by the big names. That's how you know how old somebody is when they remember. I remember mm -hmm. when it was Hurricane James or whatever <laughs> back in 1923 or something. Like that. <laughs> I, I don't know if that's the case or not. But. Yeah, right. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, we, we, you know, you lived here during uh, um, Sandy, right? Hurricane Sandy. I did. I did. Yeah. So we had and a Allison taste of did that. Too. Oh, I yeah, did, right. yeah. And it was, it was fortunate. We, Allison and I had just been married um, less than half a year when mm -hmm. Sandy hit. Uh, so she brought her wealth of hurricane preparation experience. Uh, mm -hmm. We were, we were pretty set. To, to ride out the storm. Um, it was that, I mean, it was scary nonetheless, but she was, she was pregnant with our, our older daughter uh, at the time. Um, it, and it's having gone through Ida last year, it's, it's uh, especially, and seeing all the devastation of friends up here with, or with Sandy, it was uh, quite an experience understanding uh, of, of how blessed we could be sometimes. And uh, and and knowing everything we have is is just a gift because it could go away. Yeah, yeah. So I, as as you noticed, James, I just uh, recorded on the locally. So we have the Facebook uh, interview, and, and anyone who's listening, uh, uh, we're doing this on Zoom. And if you're trying to get your podcast up and running, it's always wise to record two times if you can. So I record on Facebook live and then locally on the computer. So then there's two recordings. Uh, one time I didn't, and actually the video was messed up. So I had to mm. become an audio show. Oh, well. Anyway, um, so any, anyone who's watching, thank you. Whether you're watching live or on the replay, uh, feel free to throw in some questions if you're watching live and uh, if you're watching the replay, thank you for being here as well. Um, yeah, so we're just gonna 
got to hang out together. It's been a while. James and I are high school buddies from uh, James Madison High School in Brooklyn, New York, uh, in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. And um, yeah, cool. So now James lives in New Orleans, Louisiana. Yep. And I'm still in Brooklyn, although I've moved around here and there before landing back in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah, and so with Hurricane Sandy, uh, we had in Brooklyn in 2012, I remember, actually, that was the weekend that I'm, Yoko, uh, my wife and I moved into our house. That was the weekend. So no, no uh, you know, happy celebrations for that weekend. <laughs> no. Right out the window. The second, the, the very first week we were in the house, we had about like six guests stay with us people from Coney Island, people from Garrison Beach, who just kind of were freaking out and needed a place to stay. And I sure. knew them. So it was a good way to open up our time here. It was like, you know, this house is really a gift. So to be able to share that as the opening phase just felt felt natural. Yeah. yeah. Your house warming came by people physically being there and bodies warming up the rooms. <laughs> Yeah, right. And and I think it was uh that that was a very cold weekend, if you remember that. It was. It was, it was we we didn't get any water damage. Um, but the crazy thing was on our particular block, about five sixths, I'd say, of the block was without power for a week. The the one of the tail end of the block, the power grid for some reason worked. So people had power. In front of us, behind us, no power. Uh, all along, or power rather, and then all along our side, our, our five sixth most of our block, there was no power. Then it wasn't until I think the Thursday we got power back on Saturday um, that we realized our gas heat still worked, so we could take hot showers. Otherwise, we were boiling water and taking, <laughs> beating ourselves with uh, you know pot water. Right. Yeah. Roughing it making the best of the situation. Uh, right. But like you, you, so you didn't have hot showers that no. first couple of days? No, no. We have, we just, uh, we just used whatever water was in a pot. Um, oh. hmm. Yeah. But, but there was, as I was saying before, a giftedness of, um, you know, we were very fortunate that we didn't incur any water damage, but as you were hosting family and friends and all, uh, it was wild to see, all around us, 15 minutes in one direction, 15 minutes in another direction towards Garrison Beach, um, you know, 20 minutes where I worked on Staten Island at the time. So many people, the, the old apartment I was in prior to moving back as Allison and I were getting ready to be married, that whole section of Staten Island was, was washed out. Um, yeah. So uh, it, sometimes these natural disasters, you prepare as best as you can, but sometimes it really is the luck of the draw or um, a little bluster of wind in one direction and, and everything keeps moving. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's this, this time of, of year is not the greatest, but they're living in New Orleans, it, it kind of tying into the music piece. There are so many, uh, one of the best things about being in New Orleans is when you walk around, um, there's music everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, almost feel like, kind of again tying into what we've talked about in the past but our, in our history and our, our our memory lane uh it's it's wild to have been prepared for living down here through uh the years when i was in junior high school or high school and we were part of the jazz band and uh being familiar with jazz music and uh drawing to love it uh then moving down to one of the birthplaces of jazz yeah. and, and having that music everywhere and uh, appreciating the, the history. Um, uh, there's, there's a, the Preservation Hall Jazz Band is one of the more popular New Orleans uh, groups. And to have them play, they kind of play that Dixieland style of five or six guys just doing, I guess what you'd call stomps. Mm -hmm. um, and watching these amazing, talented, gifted musicians give their heart to the world through their saxophones or their tubas or their pianos and clarinets and um, 
it's it's it always goes right into the heart and uh it's it's amazing it's it's i i very much there sometimes it's so beautiful to walk along the french quarter and there's jazz music coming out of all these different uh restaurants and clubs and um or in the streets too they have really gifted mm -hmm. uh street musicians as well yeah i i've never been to uh new orleans and uh, i know it's a music city and i know it's uh from what i from what i know it's a jazz city more than anything is would that be true that it's kind of like primarily jazz or i would i would say there's a jazz piece mm -hmm. there's also um hip-hop and rap and uh bounce music is huge down here with other uh demographics uh so mm -hmm. kind of a, a, there's there's a rap music component and then you get like a half hour north 45 minutes north and you head towards the center of the state and that's country music town um, and then there's mm. also the Cajun Zydeco music, not too uh, far as well. Uh, it, it is this, to use a local term, it's a gumbo pot of music down <laughs> here uh, where there's a little bit of everything. Uh, there's, there's the jazz, there's, there's the blues, there's Zydeco, there's, uh, there's also like the brass bands, which are just amazing too. Um, it's 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 pretty it's pretty a special place. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I could I, I my comparison. Uh, yeah, the music cities I've been to uh, are Los Angeles, which is mm -hmm. it's a music city. It's not like out and proud music city, which I gather a place like um, New Orleans might be. You're not mm -hmm. really gonna just like you're not gonna run into it as naturally without like paying a club fee or something like that. Sure. Uh, or going to a club uh, but Austin Texas which I've been to sounds a lot like that yeah. anywhere you go in certain parts of the downtown area it's just band after band there might be five bands in the same block with the, within all the, uh, the the venues and some venues have three or four floors with each with a different band kind of yeah. going all night long it's really insane and they a lot of good quality bands of course not always, but you know, it's just such a high standard there, and like the 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 pool of uh, talent to choose from is such a high level that I think um, bars can find good talent without too much of a problem. Yeah. And the other town I've been to is Nashville, which is okay. very similar. Nashville has a lot of. Sounds like what you're saying you go down to a certain part of town. It's very similar to Austin to me. You, you go down to downtown, but of course it's more than just one area. But in the concentrated parts, you're just hearing this high quality live music all the time. And it, both Austin and Nashville definitely heavy uh, country music component, blues. Yeah. But there, there's a lot of traditional rock, you know, covering Guns N' Roses songs and like more like pop rock, more modern stuff uh, as well, for sure. It's definitely yeah. exists there. Yeah. Also, I'm aware that Nashville is kind of the heart of the Christian music scene. Like, so the Christian music industry is based out of Nashville. So you've got, you've got the country music, you've got the blues, and then all around there too, you got church people who are who are uh who are worshiping through praise and worship and writing all this all this beautiful music uh worship wise yeah i was wondering john Henry, if one of the questions i was thinking of from from you is i know that you've traveled to a ton of places you've lived internationally you've lived globally and uh you know what piece of brooklyn what piece of Brazil, what piece of Japan um, influences the way that you approach music now? That's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely playing in all those places. Uh, and I, I also had a stint in India for three weeks, which I performed there. And it wasn't like, you know, my performance was just like a, a an aside, of course, to the whole thing, but I did get to play and test out what people react to you know around the world i also played in norway a little bit and greece 
So I, I got to test out many different places. What do people like? Uh, what are people, what matters the most to people? And um, definitely got simpler and simpler as I went mm -hmm. along. Um, there's always a temptation to be complicated. You know, in high school, I was complicated was fine to me. You know, I, I was heavy metal kind of some almost progressive rock in some degree and uh certainly fast and quick intricate stuff i liked then at some point i started to feel like that wasn't going to communicate with a broad audience and i went more towards the folk stuff and uh because i also wasn't so angry and i didn't really want loud loud music in my life all the time right and i want to work with different musicians so that involved changing style a bit and so then later on, so I'd already transitioned to this kind of folk rock pop uh, style. And I also was studying jazz throughout college and playing bass and guitar and jazz bands, uh, studying classical guitar deeper in college. So I had this like kind of rich musical background to choose from. But then it was like when I started traveling India then Brazil, then Japan, it just kind of, it just all came back to the basics, which is just chords and a melody mm -hmm. and uh and then interesting thing right is lyrics how do lyrics fit in when you're performing in other countries that don't necessarily speak english so i realized that uh for me lyrics matter because i don't want to sing about something that that i don't connect with you know it doesn't have to be positive all the time but it has to be at least something i feel an emotional connection with sure and uh so that was uh i found myself from the Brazil, actually from India, uh, 2009. I started off in India and then uh, 2010, I started off in Brazil. And then 2011, I started off in Japan. And uh, th throughout that, I would go to like a lot of the classics, Stand By Me. Uh, I would go to, um, of course, Knock on Heaven's Door, played that out many times. Uh, Horse With No Name. But then things like uh, it's a small world that works really well when you're playing right. around the world, you know, they know the melody. It doesn't matter if it's kind of like trite or it's, it's, it's really not bad lyrics. It, it's not that shallow, you know, that's very kid. It's very friendly, but uh, then you are my sunshine, which actually is very dark song yeah. besides the chorus, you know, right. <laughs> but I would play that. Um, I would play uh, familiar melodies, like something when the saints go marching in, Right, that works because some somehow people know that melody. Of course, I was doing John Lennon's Imagine a lot. Yeah, uh, Michael Jackson works very well when you, when you travel the world. Um, you know, you find it, Bob Marley works translates very well. Uh, Beatles do. Um, some things don't, like uh, Billy Joel. Not not quite didn't go as far as that daughter might. You know, oh, I mean, it's not like people dislike it, but. Uh, it, it's it's pretty much a New York and American thing. Of course, he's global, but I think we kind of get an imbalanced idea of how big he really is throughout the world. Sure. You know, um, and uh, yeah, so then when I came to my own music, I'm like, I just got to play music now that um, is more, I don't want to say PC, but in some on some level it's true I, you know so this is also as i'm evolving as a buddhist too so which is being really trying to be fair-minded trying to be compassionate in all my actions including my music so i don't want to inadvertently you know be aggressive uh and kind of offend people or push people away right yeah so a good question and i was i was on a podcast the other day someone interviewed me and asked me so how do i write john how do you write songs these days and it's kind of giving them an idea of how I do it, but that's a really old idea that uh, I have no idea how I write songs these days. My, the last song I wrote, probably around 2015, 2016, possibly 2017. You know, there's so much stockpile of archive stuff that I just keep releasing when I feel musically inclined. Like it's almost like I can't write something new until I release all this stockpile. So otherwise, why did I write it? if it doesn't get out of my house, you know? Sure. So, yeah, but my approach to music anyway has been simplified. Uh, and when I do, all, I, you know, I was doing a lot of Facebook Lives in the past couple of years, and I would always try to include Japanese, or I was doing a Japanese show, then a Brazil show, because I know the words, I could speak 
sing the words in different languages and some Spanish songs, but they don't always appeal to every audience, right? So it's kind of helps to like promote it to the, you know, the crowds that might appreciate it, a particular show, but it doesn't always work out. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there's that sense of, uh, right, there's broadcasting and there's narrow casting. There's, there's like this of, of putting it up on Facebook Live that anybody who comes across it can see it. Um, and then there's maybe more specific one. I know when you were doing your Facebook Live shows, when you do specific themes and, and people who might be more uh, attuned to a trip down the 80s or 90s might have been mm -hmm. more uh, interested than, uh, than perhaps when curious to see you do the music in a different language. But uh, if there was that language barrier, maybe a little less inclined that day to, to, to cast yeah. a live piece. Right, but if I said I'm doing, uh, you know, heavy metal songs on acoustic, then certain other guys would tune in, right? Sure. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, good question. Uh, how is your approach to music? I know you have the, the, the high school years, uh, pre-high school years, and then your, I know church has been a big influence to you in terms of music. And then, of course, mm -hmm. New Orleans must have been a big influence. How, how have you seen your musical evolution evolve from let's say when we last kind of played in person and in, in Madison days, since the late nineties, how have you evolved musically? Yeah. Uh, I think that in the past, well, I guess it's close to 25 years that, that we've been uh, classmates together or schoolmates together. Um, one of the pieces I think has come into figuring out my voice. Um, I, I, re I remember, I think it was my, my senior year that you were some that you were still involved um, with us at Madison. And I remember um, it was right before, I might've even been one of the musicals. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember playing you one of the first songs that I wrote. Um, and that was a huge moment for me to play a song for you. Um, you, you know, it would be uh, trying, it was sharing this with somebody who I looked up to, who I knew wrote songs already, um, as I was learning how to do this craft and how to do this art, I was going to an artist who I knew was very adept at it. Um, and I remember that being a very uh, big deal for me. Nervous as all get up, but a very big deal. Um, and I think uh, also the more that I, as you mentioned, um, grew in my understanding of who I am as an adult and where my faith life grew, um, learning about different musicians and especially I, I had been aware of uh, music for church, but not necessarily almost that contemporary Christian music, uh, praise and worship genre, if you will. Um, and so learning more, but more about that and not thinking that it's different than the Catholic church music. Like we have the Catholic church music that's in the hymnal and then there's all that other music on. Now that's what I call worship volume five mm -hmm. that I saw at two o'clock in the morning on a, on a, a infomercial, you know, that, that this music not, not only was not just for them, but it was for me. There was a message that was uh, accessible um, and it learned learning the craft of how to write praise and worship music and and much like what you were just talking about too john henry of um the simplicity of of how writing a, a praise and worship song uh as i kind of have understood it it's you repeat this almost the the, the theme or the thesis of what you want the song to be um you know like god i love you god mm -hmm. i love you then there's the third piece is a, another it's almost like uh using a songwriting scheme like an A-A-B-A, -A -A. like it's, if A is the same phrase done twice, and then B is the part that adds on to that. And then A is the repeating of it again, the, the fourth time, or the third time of that four line mm -hmm. chorus. Um, almost something very mantra-like, if you will, of, of, of repeating that same prayer, song mm -hmm. prayer over and over. So learning about that really shaped as well. 
Um, and I, I think um, I think the New Orleans piece, especially over these past 15 years that I've been uh, associated and involved with my now wife um, and growing more and more love with New Orleans music and what New Orleans music and jazz music um, and and that music means um, similarly. I think there's a similar type of of, of path of as as I shared uh, in part one, which people can see on YouTube. Um, yeah. uh, one of my huge influences is, is the Dave Matthews Band, and and it's and it is this incredibly complex um, these complex fingerings riffs. Um, complex drumming and bass guitars because everybody is are these amazing musicians and as I've grown I've realized simple simple works and there's a reason why simple works because simple is accessible um, I think we I, I can recognize this band that I love I let them do their thing and let them be the, the, the masters that they are at this craft and I'm good at being a fan um, but when it comes to my own music, uh, the simpler is better because the simpler is more communal based. The simpler speaks um, speaks simpler, speaks the truth more simply. Mm -hmm. Not to say that complex music doesn't. Um, I think that's that that's where that when and so here and now, especially being a parent, uh, <laughs> we have gone through. Uh, the phases of all the the you know the baby songs. I think we're kind of out of that now, <laughs> but but of how important it is to just sing things simply so that our audience, who's our kids, understand it. Yeah, um, and mm -hmm. then we can kind of ride the roller coaster with them as they're growing up and they're learning about all this complex music, and uh, and then expose them to the 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 influences that we had when we were their age yeah yeah a lot of a lot of fun points there um shout out to uh, my friend Raimundo from brazil who is tuning in if he's still watching uh, hey hello hello brazil um yeah i remember uh so speaking of like the format of worship music as you came to know it like beyond catholic church music like this broader category uh, in Brazil, they, they have a big, uh, well, Brazilians love their own music. They love Brazilian music, but they also, this is big, like worship music, uh, genre that exists or, or multiple genres. And I, I have some of it that, uh, friends would like give me copies when I go there and it's, it's very dramatic. It's filled with, uh, passion and they'll say like one phrase a million times. Yeah, but they'll just keep building it, <laughs> you know, uh, whatever it is about Jesus or uh, Vale a Pena. Vale a Pena, I think, means um, the translation slips in my mind, but it's like this idea of uh, it's worth it, something to that effect. Uh, yeah, I don't know that that I saw it like it's kind of like um. Well, certainly gospel music can do that. I've heard some thunderous gospel music, like just as powerful as Iron Maiden and Metallica, like blows right. your socks out of the water stuff. Right. You know, uh, yeah. And uh, their technique is basically, we're going to, of course, it's faith-based, you know, or at least ideally it is. You know, when it's commercial, who knows if it's always as faith-based as it could be. Right. But, uh, right. right. you know, that happens. But uh the ones I've seen, you could tell there is the singer, even if they're kind of famous, they have this kind of belief in the, their band, you know, that we're all going to tap into this God energy and we're going to create something that we can't even predict almost, you know. And sure. I, I remember hearing some of these gospel musicians build from this small seed into like this massive tsunami of, of sound towards the end of it and it gives you chills. and. Uh, it's but it's it's repetitive that, that, that's the that's how it works by just kind of, it's more like this growing you know like a flower grows or vegetable or you know a tree that's the beauty like you see how this small thing can become this huge amazing thing and it, there's nothing complicated about it but it's very rich yes and involved yes you know 
Yes. Yeah. So that that uh, definitely, I'm inspired by that stuff. And I think, and what's beautiful, what what's astounding about gospel music is um, the skill level I've, mm -hmm. I've found of of musicians, particularly who are rooted in gospel, and how many of them are these virtuosos at their instruments, like bass guitarists and drummers and keyboardists and all, <laughs> and, and how many of them were self-taught at that. Right. Right. Um, where, where, if we're, where one could argue that, that there's that God's present there, that, that it's those, those natural gifts and talents that are being developed, maybe not necessarily with a, a, uh, a conservatory trained, teacher uh, but through <laughs> but through just being in the in the church hall mm -hmm. sunday after sunday or rehearsal after rehearsal and just clunking out and learning alongside these these leaders of these people who we look to and then uh, alongside these complex sometimes chord structures which you know like this progressive chord structures that blow the minds are these beautiful prayers, these humble, beautiful prayers that sometimes have these amazingly complex harmonies in them too. Um, it's wild of that that delicate that balance between the uh, the complex and the simple. And I'm thinking too of so yeah, if, if you might remember, but uh, in in the Catholic Christian tradition, there's the Teze prayer model. Um, when, so the Teze prayer was based out of this this community in France, um, and and it's it's very mantra based. Where there's an there's an ostinato refrain, where the same refrain is sung over and over and over in four part harmony, and then mm -hmm. sometimes there's a, a cantor that sings the the melody on top of that ostinato refrain. Um, it's almost very like Hindu mantra esque, mm -hmm. hypnotic in a way, right? Hypnotic, yes. right, right saying it over and over allows you to stop thinking about those words and then enter into that that prayer experience um I, i'm curious too on from your side from your from your buddhist um practice is there something in the music of the buddhist faith that is similar to that hmm. uh i would say no okay. and it, it's like a, it's a clear no um i and i my feeling is that um, the approach to music in Nichiren Buddhism, which I practice, SGI Buddhism, it's a very particular type of Buddhism. You know, there's many others, and uh, I can't speak for those. You know, just like Christianity has tons of different divisions of uh, churches and uh, what they practice and all that. Right. So Nichiren Buddhism, it's what we practice on a daily basis is chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And in and of itself, that, I mean, that, that it's, a, it's the mantra. We chant to a mandala. We face this, uh, it's called the Gohonzon. And we uh, chant, nam myoho ho renge go, nam myo ho renge go. It's in six, actually. So it flows really nice. You could chant loud. You could chant quiet. You could chant fast. You could chant slow. And when you chant in a group, there's this um, enormous energetic power. Imagine just like sometimes an hour long, uh, to a chanting session with 10 people, 20 people, 100 people, 300 people, how it's just like, it's a roar, like a lion's roar, but everyone's doing it to be their best self, you know, not to like outpace others or, you know, it's to, how can we all raise each other's life condition? That, that's the prayer, you know, you know, that's the focus of it. So it really has high vibration. And um, so since the practice is so rich with that, uh, that mantra energy, the songs are, are not, um, it's also very new. Uh, this particular SGI it was begun in the early uh, 20th century. So, yeah. you know, there wasn't any need to, to proceed with the evolution of, of a counterpart and, and, you know, like through the church music and, and the church, you know, um, uh, evolved at the same time in, in Europe and stuff like that. So sure. if you want to experiment with music and you live in Europe, it would really behoove you to be working with the church at that time, you know, right. But now there's a lot more, you know, it's so different in, in the past century and now. So now the uh, music within the SGI tends to be songs that were written 
for a particular group, like the young women's group or the young men's group, or for all the members to sing along and kind of unite in spirit. But uh, if anything, it resembles a little bit more like classical music to me. Often it's in a minor key, the songs that are from SGI, which I find a little bit strange, but it came out of wartime Japan. Okay. So there was this kind of seriousness to that at, at, at the time. But, it, it, but like one cool thing, I remember, uh, we also um, appropriate covers all the time. We'll take a song, you know, like I did um, We're Jamming by Bob Marley. And uh, I, like when I was a leader and I kind of got the assignment to work with some other people in the district and in the chapter and, and we created We're Jamming and we turned into We're Chanting and we changed all the words to, you know, to a song that we could sing as a faith group. And, you know, it's not gonna, not gonna go beyond singing it at a meeting. That's what we do. But uh, one time I remember uh, remember New York, no, Empire State of Mind, I think it was called. Sure. Jay-Z. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think they changed that to uh, Go Show State of Mind or something like that. Like, they use a Buddhist term, something State of Mind. And uh, it was really in exciting because, you know, the idea was to, like get the youth involved, get the youth to care. And, you know, but there's a lot of rappers actually who are Buddhists, which is interesting, so comedians and and they like really they bring in this like very humanistic point of view, but with like pop culture. So it's a little bit surprising to people, but appealing because people could recognize this thing they like. So that's kind of been my experience with um, the songs of, in, in the Buddhist practice that I do. That's interesting. That's interesting. It almost sounds in a way like that, that Teze prayer of, of just that, that one could chant. Right, the okay. chant, of, yeah, our daily practice has that type of vibe, yeah. for sure. So I think there's been like a hesitation within the Buddhist community to create music that has that uh, that chanting in it. Like it's almost like a taboo. I don't know if there's any rules mm -hmm. against it, but people don't try not to do that. It seems. Um, and also, there's this whole musical element of we have a within the SGI. There's a brass band. You know, oh, wow. the youth groups, there's brass band, there's taiko band. There's, you know, taiko? I don't know. Tell it's me more. Oh, oh you, you would love it. <laughs> taiko is this particular Japanese drumming style, which is like a drum dance, very tribal, very, uh, I won't say aggressive, but very energetic. Okay. Could look aggressive. Uh, it's kind of warlike. So okay. to see it done in a way which is like uh, humanistic and like really like people linking arms to like bring out each other's best it's really okay. something really, you know gives you chills so taiko uh there's a brass band this fife and drum uh, oh, which wow. is a young women's uh, division um there's choir uh there's uh, dance groups so there's a lot of youth groups that do different things uh, there's gymnastic groups wow within the sci it, it's very uh yeah, it's very impressive. Uh, and we've had some big meetings at, um, in 2000, I think it was 10 or 11. I think it was 10. Uh, I attended this really huge meeting, youth meeting. Uh, as a, I, I was part of the brass band, but interestingly, I wasn't a musician. I was, uh, and of course, it reminds me of Jay Madison, you know, being in the marching band. Right. But, you know, they didn't need a guitarist. And uh, I... They didn't need a trumpet player, and I didn't own a trumpet. I wasn't ready to do trumpet, and I could do drums, but they didn't need one. So what they needed was a, a flag waver. Okay. So I was I was a flag person, and uh, you know I, I kind of I was a little bit older than because there was a, a lot of young people, and but I was I took the training, you know, to how to wave the flag right for the certain sure. songs, and very energetic. And we had a performance at Temple University in. Uh, Philadelphia okay in their main uh, gymnasium uh, whatever um, performance hall and I think there were 10,000 people there wow they had 10,000 wow. SGI members and guests okay. if they want that and we were all there to like have these incredible youth performances the Tyco performance itself featured uh, all east all members youth members from the east coast that got together bust in and they had like two days of intensive rehearsals and there's like I want to say 300 uh, drummers on and on filling the floor like a basketball, you know, uh, floor uh -huh. of drummers doing this intense drumming together that 
was kind of based on faith. They would chant beforehand and intense stuff. Wow. I'll have to give that Tycho uh, Drummond or Tycho. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll try to find a good video that be that kind of conveys it. it. It could lose something when it's not in person, but uh, sure. yeah, and I'll send it to you. And maybe you put in the show notes or something. That'd be great. That'd be great. I was wondering too, so one of the thoughts I had too, John, it was like, so you brought up that that Temple University flag waving and yeah. music experience. Um, and I was trying to think of like, to go, going down memory lane of what were some experiences maybe in high school um, that we shared, uh, some experiences in your, in your professional gig music career, um, where you had performances that were just special. They were ones that were up in your hall of fame of, of experiences. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, so from Madison, the, the show that stands out the most from high school days was, uh, I, I guess, I, I don't know if you were, I guess you might've been in the band I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, it was, I, I don't know if you were in the jazz band that year, but it was 1996. Okay. Um, winter. Uh, that would have been my freshman year then. And were you in the band already at that, that would, point? Yeah, that, I would have been in the jazz band. That would have been my first uh, set right. of Madison concerts. Yeah, yeah. So 1996 Christmas, like that, that the holiday concert. Yeah. That was super memorable for me. We did 25 or 6 to 4. And that was like the time I was allowed to really just go for it as a solo, you know, uh, with the guitar solo. Yeah. And using elect, uh, you know, distortion and everything. Mr. Rams was okay with that. And uh, I think it was Dave Evans on the drums. It might actually have been uh, Mike Perlman for that show on the drums. And um, you weren't playing drums on that. No, I think it was Mike Perlman. I don't know okay. if you remember. Well, if it was, if, I, I, I do remember playing 25 or 6 to 4. So it might have been, uh, depending on the day, Dave and I might have traded off on that. Yeah, on that when you were freshman? Freshman, yeah. Yeah, because Mike would have graduated. Mike graduated in 96. And I, oh, okay. I, so I took moved. over. I, in essence, I took, Dave moved up. And then I filled Dave's spot as the, right, right. the younger cool. drummer. So maybe that was with you. I do, re I do remember 25 or 6 to 4. Um, as we had mentioned last time, Chicago was one of the bands of influence in my household. So once that chart wound up on our music stands, I part of there was the reading piece of this. Um, and then there was the challenge of making sure that I didn't read by ear because mm -hmm. I had heard 25 or 6 to 4 for ages. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I do, I do remember, I do remember uh, that, that, that beautiful connection of, of energy of like you getting to do something that you are amazing at. And, and uh, just all I had to do was make sure that uh, I didn't, I gave you the downbeat and that I didn't screw that part up. And as, as long as we did that, just let you work your magic. Right, yeah, it's pretty much you and the bass player holding it down and for the guitar solo, right? I don't think there's much horn action or anything. I don't Probably think not. so, no. Um, yeah, all right. So, yeah, you and Dave uh, would have been on 25 or 6 to 4. And yeah. um, cool. So, that, yeah, that was a standout performance for me, of course, because I got to kind of be in my, uh, my, my prime uh, strength. But also yeah. then after that night, uh, you know, I was like, okay, tonight I'm going to shine and then I'm going to go out and meet a girl or something because the girl I was going after wasn't really into me. And then it turns out that that was uh, triggered my first girlfriend and I, you know, getting together. So, sure. you know, I definitely remember that well. And um, quite a few good um, Madison jazz band concerts. Or, you know, sometimes just rehearsing was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, for me, the marching band, it's not particularly great memories musically. Socially, it was cool, you know, just the experience is unique. Musically, it was just kind of different. Right. Um, I think, too, because it's crazy to think that at this point in time, uh, the marching band has kind of just been in existence for 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we were at the beginning of it. 
and and that was just when people were just figuring it out before oh, yeah, were sure, yeah. you know and, and 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 i think that there was the, the rudimentary piece we were the we were the rudimentary and it's it's wild yeah. to you know even to tie it in of of down here um mardi gras season uh which which the city is very much known for um if we were in New Orleans, our Mardi Gras season would be as busy as St. Patrick's Day season was at home in Brooklyn mm -hmm. because every uh, neighborhood has a parade and all these parades hire out the local school marching bands. Um, so, you know, our, our Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays would be filled for a month with all these Mardi Gras parades. Mm -hmm. um, that you, anytime I see these bands go by, uh, I, I am often whisked away to, you know, being in the Rockaways or being in Park Slope or mm -hmm. uh, down Forest Avenue in Staten Island with, with <laughs> our, our uh, Madison experiences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong, marching band memories are, are precious and I, I full respect to Mr. Rams and uh, yeah. whoever, whatever the other teachers were. That, I mean, I was very impressed that they're willing to put in the crazy amount of effort to make that happen yeah. i would not be inclined to, as a teacher so well, i you know very intense uh, you're very impressive but just as a musician and come from a heavy metal background guitar player it was you know not my element but uh, for you i'm sure you had a lot of fun playing you, you look like you had the most fun because you had the, the four drums with the chorus yes. so i'm yeah. like that was probably the funnest drum in the whole band you know as far as i'm concerned <laughs> It was, it was, because uh, <laughs> there's, there's the two, there's, you could do one of two things. You can read the music like it was, which was almost, would almost be like a timpani or it would be like reading, um, it'd be like reading a piano or reading any other type of music that had more so like a piano because you could have pitches at the same time, two tones at the same time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, since I already have the grade, I can kind of say that I was about like 60% of the time mm -hmm. I read the music and about 40% of the time was like, I'll just boop -a -doop -a -dip -a -doop -a -dip -a doop dip a doop dip just uh, whatever <laughs> was feeling based. I just considered those the fill measures uh, right. like in a jazz band chart. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think the statute of limitations are over that <laughs> uh, my, my grades won't be expected. Yeah, I think... Uh... Yeah, I mean, I always loved hearing the quads. That, that that those are kind of a highlight to me. Um, the drums in general, or the marching band, were if it's a good section, were the coolest part about it to me. The winds just kind of come and go depending on where where your ears are. You know, it's like I hear right. them, I don't hear them. You know, but the drums you right. always can hear more or less. Right, because we had to keep playing. That was the part of it too. Was was mm -hmm. as soon as as soon as the our part of the parade started. Uh, either we were playing the charts or we were playing the cadences to keep keep yeah. time to keep everybody moving uh, in a relatively uniform fashion. Um, mm -hmm. So there were, there was going to be a lot of us. Um, yeah, and there, there's you know there's something about uh, even what you were talking about with the the the, the drums from the Buddhist group, um, the taiko drums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know that there's something that uh, it speaks to like our inner nature i think it speaks to our heartbeat you know it 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 helps uh it, it connects it calls us to pay attention when you hear drums yeah like that or even down here especially um depending on depending on the band and and the makeup of the band either you have like your standard um kids that are taking music for a grade in class and they have to march or you have like these intricate drum drum lines where these guys all they do is play their drums and they play all these rudiments and 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 it's you know drum and bugle core quality uh dexterity and speed and um and 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 the cymbal players are dancing around and all it it, it kind of uh brings back a lot of good memories when when uh when you see these marching bands all make their way around town yeah i'm sure a fun aside i, I there's an aspect of my musical past maybe you don't know about um in 2007 and 8 i taught at a uh excuse me a high school um i, I, might, I might have mentioned this but uh 
in Thomas Jefferson High School, East New York, uh, at a small school called Paths, a charter school within it. And um, I was the music teacher. And uh, so we had a band, like a rock band, which is kind of similar to what that 25 or 6 to 4 band, or maybe like in the spring music, all the kind of bands we formed. Sure. I would form with whatever students just kept showing up. Because who, which students showed up day to day was not that consistent in that school. Okay. Uh, and then, then there's a, uh, there was a, um, I want to say a marching. It wasn't a marching band. It was like a drum corps or something. I, I forgot what they called it, but it was a drum group. And uh, I wasn't officially the leader. I was kind of assigned to kind of oversee it, make sure they didn't, they didn't cause trouble or something. I'm not exactly sure what my relationship to it was, but. Uh, they practiced and there was this one student who was kind of in charge. He was like 15 and I don't know if anyone put him in charge or the, the kids just kind of agreed to listen to him or he, he went as under a lot of stress, you know, cause he also, I don't know if he was, how much he was paying attention to his, his schoolwork, but he thought this was really important and he did a good job with it. But anyway, so I was there to kind of support that. And then in January of 2008, I was kind of not co-opted, but the principal thought it would be a good idea if I go with them, the drum group to uh, a drum competition in Chicago. Okay. They needed another adult. And I was a music teacher anyway. And uh, I didn't really want to go, but I said, I really want these guys to succeed. And, you know, they're, they're, they're on like a, a string and a prayer here. So if I go, it'll probably help. So I went and, I was, I was like the guy in charge. I mean, I didn't even want to go. And what would they have done if I didn't go? You know, it was so right. bizarre. And uh, then the bus broke down and then this uh, principal flew out to see us and flew home. She knew the bus broke down. She didn't even talk to me about anything. It, it was a terrible experience. I got fired uh, at the end of the year because I wrote a report outlining that I didn't like the way the principal treated us and everything. And, and the guy, the vice principal was like, show you one hand this in. I'm like, it's the truth, man, what we're going to do. Right. And uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I saw this incredible drum competition in Chicago with all these, you know, I guess inner city school bands. And uh, my band was one of them. I, I wasn't in charge of what we did, but I was kind of in charge of keeping the spirit and the morale up. I didn't do too mm -hmm. much of the musical stuff, even though I could play drums. I left it to them. But right. anyway, so I have that part of my history as well. That's wild. That's uh, even just to be able to be there and present with that group of yeah. um, youth and, and paying, paying it forward in a way of, of uh, continuing to offer uh, your gifts and talents to them, but also to help instruct them in the ways that we were instructed really well um, through, our, through our high school years and through your, your years of in, in being instructed with guitar and, and other instruments. Um, yeah. I mean, to speak to that time, even though it was like really tough and professionally it's kind of, I mean, just more and more convinced me that I don't want to be a teacher in the New York City school system, but I, I am in touch with, I would say about five, maybe, maybe more uh, Facebook friends I don't really think about, but at least, at least three or four who I actually like regularly each year contact a few times and say, hey, how you doing? A couple of them came to my house from that school in 2007, okay. 2008. Those, those kids that are just like rough and tumble kids that I was just kind of, you know, pouring whatever. I'm like, I'm in this garden. It's tons of weeds, but I'm, this looks like a plant that might grow. I'm going to just water it and give it as much sunshine as possible, you know? Right, right. And they never forgot it, you know? And for me, I'm, I'm always Mr. Sheridan to them. <laughs> they have a hard time calling me John. You, you know how it is, right. like me, talk to our I, I do, yeah. teachers. But uh yeah, so, you know, for me, I'm really proud that I made that I had the courage to go into that difficult job and at least create some human connections that, that lasting. That's beautiful. That's, that's part of, of what this is all about is, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been reflecting on that a lot um, recently, having hit the big 4-0 uh, back in June. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been very retrospective and introspective uh, over these past few months and and that's that I, I think you, you're speaking a really uh, amazing truth uh, of 
kind of what really what ties up your, your podcast about music and philosophy and more and even the, the spirituality piece of 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 as we grow and mature and we we acquire this this greater understanding of of ourselves and 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 this unique blend of the good things that we are um the ways that we work past the the hurts and the the uh, the, the soft spots of the points of of growth and improvement or the you know are one of the things i like to the blind spots as it were mm -hmm. um, the things that it's tough to see where we fail or where we we falter um we're this with this combination and and as we grow and we more mature and we we understand how much less the world needs to be about us and more about the people who we come into contact with and, and interact with um that especially when, when we take the time to recognize how lucky we are or, or what great gifts we were given especially for those of us in talking about this of 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 the role the foundational role that music has played in our lives that we can't help but share that with other people because it's it's filled us with so much joy and so much satisfaction and so much um, energy and fire um, mm -hmm. that makes us attractive in good ways. Like it, that's, that's what makes us attractive to, to our peers and friends. Like the, the, we're sitting next to each other in, in jazz band and, and, and recognizing that, uh, you know, we not only can we work together well as musicians, but we can also find some things that we're able to joke about or to be silly, mm -hmm. have similar senses of humor. Um, and, and, and that music I thought was gonna help me when I was in high school attract girls, but maybe I just didn't know how to use it the right way at that point in time. Mm -hmm. um, but over time of, of using these gifts of music as a way to express my feelings or express our feelings to people. Um, and then even from what we've talked about so far tonight of, of the, the, the beauty of how it helps build people or bring people together, how it helps to um, inspire people who we mentor, the people who we walk along with and um, you know, the, seed, the seeds and the weeds, almost what you're talking about with the garden that's that's mm -hmm. all weedy and you, but we find the one good spot, a good soil that we could plant the seed and water it and cult, help cultivate it. And, uh, and sometimes we don't even get to see it fully grow. That's what um, for a few friends of I in, in the work that I do have been reflecting about as of late is like trying to it, just keep on plugging away. Um, sometimes it's hard to see the fruits of your labor to see if, if what we've done has been worth it. Mm -hmm. oh yeah i know what you mean you know so i but I, I think that that's that's really great of of what you've been able to experience and what you've been able to um the the relationship you've been able to continue with the students that that you walked along with at that time mm -hmm. yeah thank you and uh, to add to the garden metaphor um i'm a gardener actually pretty actively these days and uh awesome. you know um sometimes you plant a seed or you, you experiment, you buy a new vegetable or herb or something that you never really used before. And you don't really know what you're going to get. So in the case of like, or you don't know why you're doing it, you know, what, what it's going to, what the real value is. So like in the case of some of the students, maybe I've dealt with or the people you work with, you don't know exactly what's going to come out of you pouring your soul into them or you hope they'll become a professional musician or something, whatever it is you hope. Right. And it's not what happens 99% of the time, but what happens might be very beautiful. That just in a way you just can't predict, you know? So it's like, sometimes you just pour your love into it and then something is blossoms that, and then and that brings me to another point. I remember, uh, cause you were saying sometimes it's hard to see the the if the work you're doing i'm doing we're doing is having an effect in the world or if it's worth all the effort or blood sweat and tears and uh one one of my good 
one of my guitar teachers um, who wasn't a one-on-one -on -one guitar teacher, but he was a group guitar teacher in college, uh, Lars, uh, very great supporter of my guitar comp composition and everything and a good friend. He said one time, I don't know if it was directly to me, I just overheard him. He said to class maybe that I don't take credit from my great students. Like, as, cause of course, he had some students who are incredible players. Uh, he said, because if you take credit for my great students, I have to take credit for all my bad students or my <laughs> poor. You know? And it's like, yeah, true. You can't. So in other words, it's not like you just, you know, hands up, punch this pilot, I wash my, it's not like that. It's more like, um, I'm not uh, in control of what happens beyond what I'm doing here, but I'm right. going to do my best. Uh, and then go to sleep at night. You know, I'm going to do my best, give my all to the student in person, the student, the person, whoever it is in front of me and trust that my doing my part is, you know, what, I'm, what I came here to do essentially. You know, like I could think of a student of mine who's like really advanced musically and kind of, I want him to give me credit on some ego level that, you know, I don't know how to express it, but you know, I realized he's, I taught him that thing he's doing, you know, um, whatever on Facebook. But at the same time, then I'll get like a different friend from left field who comes and says, oh, you're trying to do a podcast? Uh, yeah, let me, let's just get together and I'll walk you through all the steps. And he just teaches me all how to do it. And what am I supposed to do? I said, thank you. You know, if I, then I'll say thank you to him. And then I'm going to go, but I'm not going to like keep thanking him over and over again. So just similar to the student who I want to appreciate me. He may say thank you once or twice. He may not, but my job was to teach him. And then we learned. And then, then I have the opportunity to learn from other people. So it's like, where does credit start? Where does it begin? You know, as long as we just appreciate what we have in every moment, appreciate the person in front of us, give our all to the moment, you know, we can't worry about the, the results of our labor so much, I think. Mm. Yeah, that's some that's some good food for thought uh for sure um yeah there's there's uh i i'll even a way of uh one of the one of the gifts that we have i think at this point in time in our lives is you, you, I mean, you have facebook we have social media where we're able to keep tabs of the people who we interacted with in this role, mm. you know, um, yeah, I, I was interested too. I was, I was thinking about this as well, um, of how, how the, our, even talking about our, our group of high school classmates or schoolmates of, uh, almost when, when our generation prior, like our parents, maybe even our grandparents, um, how they, they pretty much stayed in Brooklyn or stayed in New York City um, and how our generation, our, our, our classes, I, you know, I think of all of the folks that we were in school with and the various uh, places around the country, like I'm here in New Orleans, I think of folks that are in California or North Carolina or Texas or Pennsylvania or Colorado, like there's tons of us, there are a number of us that are all around the country right now. Um, mm -hmm. And thankfully we have things like this where we're able to, to, to reconnect with each other and to, um, you know, in some ways keep tabs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, if we can't always make it to the, to the watering hole. Um, you know, I, I realized too, that was, that was one of the things of, of my own experience was once I graduated from Madison, um, and I went to St. John's that became my people that became my group of people. Yeah. Naturally. And, um, cause I, it was, I was investing the time to be, even though it was, you know, a 40 minute drive away, um, it was a whole different world at some way, point in time. And, and it wasn't until we all started popping up on MySpace or Facebook together that, uh, it was kind of clear of like who of the people we were together with stayed together and, and, and how I wound up being, part of the people like looking in like oh hey look at those guys they're still hanging out together that's nice mm -hmm. not, not me but that's <laughs> nice um but it is it's neat to see or to think about how um 
these these common experiences that we shared, um, how they are still able to to bring us right back. Those I was always asking in some ways about that question about like those those moments of performances with high school that really stuck out um, because I think those those special moments have a way of of um, well communicating something really special about where our divine creator, where God calls us to be in, in, in life. And, uh, you know, to be able to share that moment with other people, um, that's, that's you know, some piece of what we're all here about for, of, of not just uh, the musical gifts that we have. When you're talking before about um, not really wanting to write new music until you finish putting out the work you've developed over all these years, um, that that's that's something uh, that's important of of wanting to make sure that the music that we've created doesn't just stay on a computer hard drive or stay on a, a, a CD, but it's shared with other people. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I got to learn how to do because uh, mm -hmm. there's all these songs that I've written and I've maybe played a couple of times to to my wife or to my parents or to my, my family members or some friends. I remember there's one time in college um, when I lived on campus and I think it was, there was like a snowstorm outside and uh, I had the, I'll use a term from our people of chutzpah to, to go ahead and say, uh, you know what, I'm going to break out my guitar. I'm going to sing my songs and some Dave Matthews band because I know how to play that. And, uh, and there was that buzz of, of sharing that music with other people uh, that was that was really special. Um, and then never quite followed up on that after the fact. Um, once in a while they had a, had, when I was a, when I worked at St. John's Staten Island campus, we used to have uh, open mic nights. The multicultural affairs guy would bring a band and people would do open mic and they'd do poetry or they'd sing songs or whatever. And then I'd bring my guitar and I'd sing a song that I wrote and everybody would kind of like look like that's the, he works in, campus ministry right it, i didn't realize he wrote songs um it's that little it's trying not to make a hidden talent so hidden mm -hmm. um, but we but we have these uh i think that that that's something that i've, I've learned about oh, a couple of things that have come to mind uh even getting ready to talk about tonight about that yeah man i, I mean i yeah i remember whatever song bits that i've heard of your original stuff and or, or you playing covers your appreciation for music is so deep so how and your musical sense is so keen so how could what you pr produce not be similar you know because you know what makes a good song as a fan so when you create a song you know it's coming through you know i've heard of, there's a few of the original stuff on YouTube, right? Am I mistaken? There is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's, mm -hmm. there's, you know, kind of even mentioned the question I threw out at you. There's one uh, experience I had. Well, uh, about 15 years ago, I was in Australia, um, and it was for the World Youth Day celebrations, which are almost similar to what you're talking about with the temple um, mm -hmm. experience you had. Um, but it was almost a million members of the Catholic Church that were all together. Um, and we were with this group with Brooklyn, with the Diocese of Brooklyn. Um, and I'd written a song because I felt that's what I just did. Like, I'll just write a song because I can. And I did. I worked on it, put it together. And uh, they had these prayer services. We'll call them prayer services. Um, and somehow the, the people that ran our, our trip said, why don't you play your song? And there was a, a praise and worship band. It's all tied together today. There was this praise and worship band that was leading the, the music and I played my song and they kind of followed in pretty quickly. And then all of a sudden, this, this church that was filled with like 400, 500 people was up and moving back and forth. And what, what any songwriter hopes happens with their, with their piece of music. Mm -hmm. um, that same song I did with a global group uh, of sharing a similar charism together, a, a similar um, religious organization, and and that same thing happened to people getting up and dancing, and it was it's it's an, it's addictive. It's very addictive mm -hmm. of people responding the way that the rock star dreams in our heads um, hope to 
have accomplished. Um, <laughs> and that was those those are pretty those are pretty special experiences because they were these global responses to a universal message um, with with faith in there with with the Catholic Christian gospel message in there. Um, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's really cool to be an instrument and then like because I, I do remember too at the same time I was singing the song and I heard the song coming out of the speakers and I in my head I was singing and playing this music but the the I'll, I'll get close to the mic this is what was my going on in my head like who is singing this <laughs> who is singing this? are you singing this song James because that, that I mean it sounds like you but it is it yeah. you I'm not terribly <laughs> sure right now <laughs> Wow, interesting. I can relate to that feeling, yeah. So in a way, it sounds to me like you were essentially channeling the song. Like yeah. you were like a, a channel for the, the higher power of the spirit to, to some come through you. You were kind of yeah. submitting yeah. yourself to, to, the, to the will of the divine there. Very much, very much. Uh, one, one term is kind of being an open read. Like, a, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Breath, um, I was an instrument. I was very much an instrument that at that point in time. Um, yeah, right. Like yeah, Saint yeah. Francis's prayer, right? Lord, make me right. instrument of your peace. Right. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's kind of like the peak state, right? When when we're able to just kind of channel the energies that the universe. I, I tend to use the word universe, God, yeah. the universe yeah. put us here for. You know. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think. Those are some of the best moments uh, for me. A similar moment. Uh, you're talking about highlights in my career. Yeah, musical please. career. And when I say career, I mean it in like a very um, multiple way. Because you know, I don't know if I've ever had a career in my life. You know, uh, but my uh, trajectory, which is the, the word career, essentially means like to careen a career. It means like the trajectory of a pet. Mm -hmm. In my career uh, as a composer, uh, 2007, I think it was August, maybe it could have been September. Um, I so it was right before I took that job in the, the, the inner city school there in uh, yeah. East New York. Um, I was like, kind of, um, I, I took a gig as a composer for a dance, Amer I think the American Dance Therapy Association, maybe. And um, this woman asked me to create a piece, compose a piece of music so that a, this group of dance therapists can do kind of improvised, somewhat formalized dance on the steps of Brooklyn Borough Hall. And uh, so, I don't know, it was, I guess, spring. I was asked to do it and I had a few months. I think I was given $500 total for all the effort, you know, but at least it was something, you know, it was rare to get paid for, to compose. And uh, I, 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 it was the first time I did music. So at that point, I quit rock bands. And I was like really letting the rock band thing sit for a while. I wasn't even doing too much guitar, you know, singer-songwriter stuff either. I was just letting it simmer down and uh, kind of burnt out. But as a composer, and I just moved into my first apartment, so I had time to... I had no internet down there, which was great. So I had time to really just like focus on this. And um, I did it all keyboard. I did it with a finale. And I was able to get the songs, uh, the sounds good enough on finale that that was what they used to at the performance. You know, okay. so there was no like uh, garage band even or a Pro Tools type of thing. It was just right. all finale that I kind of got it to sound pretty good and i did and this was like so you're composing like a score now i tend to work with garage band so it's more audio based but i was using like old school scoring out note by note stuff and uh five five movements all based on brooklyn bar hall i did a lot of research about brooklyn to write it and um it's really good really good music i still enjoy listening to today it's it's a little bit thin because it's just finale kind of midi instruments but right um and then just seeing but anyway so there it was the day of the performance um and i get to brooklyn borough hall and there's a bunch of dancers there and uh 
like dance therapists. So these are people who want to heal people with dancing, right? It's not just like to look cool or something. And then there's these big speakers set up. And then I, I, I don't know if they rehearsed it. They probably did. I don't remember. But then here we go. And then there's my piece of music and it sounds good. And there, I think it ran for 25 minutes or something like that. And it's just on and on. And then a very rich gamut of different cultures. And, you know, there's this Jewish element, like actually uh, the dancers kind of like made it a point to show the different ethnicities in Brooklyn and stuff. And, and this uh, African-American Caribbean and uh, the Russian, you know, and it's all right there and different age groups. And then the people in the street just started getting whirled into it and everyone's dancing. And it was like, oh man. And this was my music that I composed. Nobody knew it, you know, which is great. So I'm part of this, this like magical um, musical moment that multicultural moment that I, I was a key component in and, and nobody knew it. It was like this private, not joke, but uh, this private moment with, 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 god the universe with yeah. my purpose in life seeing it was like a confirmation of something you know yeah i'd say you even say it was intimate like uh, to use that word like there was that intimate encounter um, yeah with the divine really yeah like to have you know because i i brooklyn means a lot to me as you know i wrote a song about it and everything i do know yeah you know and uh and to have a brooklyn borough hall and then marty marcos comes out and was part of the dance and they like, like awesome. the dancers like escort him down and everything so it's this cool way to like have touched brooklyn history for a moment you know oh, great that's amazing that is amazing uh i'm conscious of my, i have like time for like one or two more questions before we before we uh oh, sure, yeah, end yeah. our time together um yeah i i was so like if i know you mentioned one of the, the moments was the uh, 25 or six to four. Um, but if you could put on a DVD or pull up a YouTube video of like, let's say three of the stuff we did at Madison to show your son, like this is the best of, of my high school. It's like, if you want to understand how amazing high school can be, there'll be some challenges you're going to figure out your life you're going to um you're going to stumble you're going to fall you're going to get up and 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 you're going to be amazing um like what would be let's say three uh memory lane trips that you'd like want to be able to have that you could pull up on a, a video to show to show kai Ooh. that's a fun question um yeah feel free to jump in with 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 any of yours as i'm wondering sure. mine uh, sure. one memory you know, uh, that just kind of jumps out is um, hanging out with Jason Hills in chemistry class. Uh, I guess this would have been like winter 96 um, when I first kind of got friendly with him and we were just totally goofing off. And I, I always like respecting teachers, but we just couldn't because we we were almost like uh, we're falling in love with each other, you know. We just like we're like, oh, he's a new friend, and this guy is likes to just make jokes, and uh, and he was gonna start playing keyboard in my band, and like so. It was just we couldn't focus on the class. Chemistry was so freaking boring anyway. So <laughs> so we're passing notes back to each other. I was making cartoons of uh, basically me beating him up or like decapitating him, and just like really, you know, with my straight face, just like handing it to him, <laughs> sure. and he would be like. But, you know, why are you doing this? And this, these kind of fun, goofy. That was a moment that I, I can't say I missed, but it was a lot of fun, you know? Yeah. And not even that you miss it, but like, uh, I, I, um, I, I enjoy watching or reading the Harry Potter series. Mm -hmm. um, and they're like those, those pensive moments, um, those moments that uh, were stored in this, in this big vat that you could kind of pull up and, access right away so that's that's one of those those type of moments of like um or even i, I love watching disney stuff so like the inside out those core memories that on on high school on madison island would, would be something like that mm -hmm. um what's one that pops up here yeah i, I, I was yeah it, it's a I, it actually you know it involves you um and I, and i know i've shared it with you and with jason as well um but it's very 
core would have been um, the rehearsals that we did for our senior sophomore sing of 1998. Yeah, um, that, was, that was a lot of fun. It was, it was. And it was, it was everything. It was similarly to you and, and Jason having that, that we'll say bromant of, of, uh, <laughs> of, of developing this friendship this, that's, that's lasted all these years now. Um, to be able to have been brought in to the, into your circle was huge, um, being two years younger. Um, yeah, right. So like getting to, to rehearse, like going to your, your basement and hanging out and, and, and playing music. And, and, and admittedly, like I, I thought I was being such a rebel listening to Living on a Prayer. Um, for whatever reason, I thought, like, oh, I get to hear this music and play it. And my mom doesn't say a thing about it. I'm in right. sign me up but but there was also just that of of uh, the, the the friendship that was developed um it, it was it was a moment of belonging that that I I very much treasure um I think too of um our my senior year when uh, we did the the spring musical and uh, it was a big deal because Mr. Littman, who had done all the spring musicals for three years prior, that was the first year he said, I, I kind of got to give it up. And there was a point in time where it almost might not have happened, um, but the combination of Mr. Rams and Miss Wallow and now yeah, Mrs. Wallow Rose, um, and then getting tabbed to be the student director for it, um, which was that first dabbling into music directoring, musical directoring. Um, mm -hmm. that was pretty special to be able to put it together and, and to be filled with like these beautiful musical moments. Um, and then, uh, you know, some, sometimes of like some of the songs where I was trying, I was learning and learning by failing of like trying to teach harmonies to people and it just not working when it came time to being on stage mm -hmm. and trying to play a song along with them. And like, this is, this is flaming, this is a this is a Hindenburg mm -hmm. Zeppelin explosion, but okay, here's what it is. But there was um, I I got to sing yesterday as my like solo, and it was one of those moments of just it was that that pinnacle of um, of four years of hard work and four years of growth and mm -hmm. four years of building up my confidence to be to prepare to be this young adult that I was about to become uh, as well um yeah and then I think the the I really the, I remember the first ticker tape parade that we did too with with the margin band uh it would have been your senior year um that was in Manhattan I guess right yeah down the, the canyon of heroes down Broadway mm -hmm. um it was big because, uh, well, it would have been my freshman year and your junior year. Was it? Yeah, it would have been um, when the, the first World Series deal we were supposed to be, but then they pulled us out for whatever reason. And that was like a heartbreaking, crushing thing. Because we were like, I'm just going to march in a parade. Mm -hmm. um, but then we got to do it that, that 98 year. Um, so that was that for, was that was for Yankees. That's what we Yankees, watched. For? Yeah, okay. yeah. So that would have been when what? That what would have been ninety eight. Um, now that I'm doing the math, you may have been in college by then. Um, mm. But that just that just that experience of I guess which is tying all of the things that we've been talking about for this past hour and a half of music connecting us to bigger people and to bigger experiences and to and the way that that music. Um, brings out the best in people mm -hmm. um that was just this unbelievable experience of of this 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 feeling of celebration this feeling of, of victory uh, mm -hmm. and of being a part of this joyful <laughs> moment everybody was there to be joyful and to celebrate and to and to appreciate the these superhuman efforts of these baseball players uh, and that was watching just the, the 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 paper falling from the sky and and being in where 
people would give uh, uh, these crazy amounts of money just to come and visit. Um, mm-hmm. And then we t- and we take it for granted because we got on a bus and we wound up down the Canyon of Heroes. Um, yeah, that that was pretty special. That would be pretty neat too. I was, uh, my my daughter uh, and my my wife just were in Manhattan back in May. So May was the first time we I got to go back home for the first time in three years because of everything mm-hmm. with with the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was pretty special to take them in. They had a, a side trip planned um, for years, but that the pandemic had delayed. Um, so to take them into Manhattan when my, my daughter was a, a, a she was four or five, so she really didn't remember. Mm-hmm. the experience of of being in Manhattan um, and to share the city that I grew up in that meant a lot to Allison and to point out all of its major landmarks and be like here you are this is where you're going to stay for the, for a week um, and kind of passing by that canyon here as I'm like and I played a bunch of cool parades there um, <laughs> that was that was a pretty special pretty special experience that I would I would share off as well yeah um, yeah, cool man so that. yeah i guess you gotta get moving i i do i do um i thank you john thank john here for uh for doing part two um yeah I, I, if i'm free again this time next year uh, <laughs> we can certainly do part three i do have I've, I've been working on it i haven't fully read it yet but i got your my thank you for my copy of mind your music oh cool mm-hmm. so i've been yeah, my pleasure i've been i've been reading it i appreciate sorry we didn't get to see each other back in may we tried to arrange it but schedules didn't quite work but yeah i know um, when you're visiting it's like so much you want to do in so a short amount of time so right i know right. that feeling right and uh yeah if anybody wanted to follow the stuff that i do at james behan on instagram mm-hmm. and facebook too or james behan jr on facebook so okay yeah and whatever links i were in the last show I'll, I'll put similar links and uh yeah and i'll have it up i think on youtube tonight probably fantastic and if you can stand for a minute, can we do a, a quick uh, picture um, where we can yeah. smile for a thumbnail? So the way that we'll look do. through the whole video. And I don't smile often enough, so I'm like, oh, I can't find it. <laughs> All right, so here we go. And one more. All right, cool. Fantastic. That should be good. All right. Thanks again, James. Uh, thank thank you. you all for watching. Whoever's been thanks. hanging out with us uh, live on the replay and uh, and have a wonderful rest of your summer, James. Thanks. You and, too, uh, we'll be in touch. All right. Good night, everybody. Take care.